Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Guangdong Lover, but NRA 24th Army? Oh, I don't remember seeing this one too often. Uh, Liu Wenhui. But anyway, it's the Dark Satanic Mills. Lamps survey the scene, furniture thrown across the room, books tossed to the floor, and doors and cupboards flung open inside. He turns attention back to the blubbering legislative council member who owned this house. He was Matsushita Man. No surprises as to the likely culprits. Those would never have happened under the Suzuki. Under, under Suzuki, the man shrieked, his voice sawing through Lamb's skull. Him or Matsuzawa, that dog is destroying this place, don't you see, don't you see? Lamb bobbed his head mechanically in response and scribbling down the man's words in his notebook. He assured the man that the police would do their best to find the perpetrators of this crime, only to be met with another round of shrill denunciations. As little as Lamb cared for the man, he understood his concern. The chief executive was letting his dog drawn off the leash and terrorizing the entire country in the process. The police, shot through with Hitachi men, were unlikely to be of much help. Despite that knowledge, despite the practice of cynicism, that taken root in Lamb's soul, his heart couldn't help but tear a little when his captain told him not to investigate the incident any further. He supposed he wasn't too much different from the Matsushita man in a certain way. Both were trapped in Komai's hexscape, staring down a future that was uncertain, only that they did not know which sin would drag them under first. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, as they're purging the innards, which I believe I read last time. So if you want to read this one, please go right ahead. And I believe I also read Necessary Sacrifices. I can see I just reloaded the game save, but whatever. So if you want to read this again, please go ahead. Necessary Sacrifices, because, you know, we are all, we're all making sacrifices here. But some comments include, after this Komai run, can you do a Tino submod run with the submod called Sony Plus? Well, maybe. We'll see. Eventually. Probably. Disciplinary action. Um... Also, Shida learned quickly that the one-on-one -on -one meetings with the chief executive were never a good sign. There were excuses for Komai to tear into him over some perceived slight or failure. Today was no exception, of course. I cannot stress enough, Masashida. It's vital for the well-being of our government that we maintain decorum. Perhaps you're men of their grievances, but their open contempt of government policy on the Lego floor only serves to demean themselves and the council. I understand, chief executive. It won't happen again. The Matsushita tried not to spit his words out like rancid beef. All they had done was object to an absurd proposal from one of the Hitachi legislators. Masashita was only here because he couldn't whip enough votes for him, frankly. I was a little glad he failed. Good, Kamai said, and I hope we'll not have this conversation again. The coy's negotiator has been an expense. I shouldn't have it at all. Masashita bit his cheek to suppress an angry outburst. So that was why the three of his men were in the hospital. Because of those thugs, you know, Kamai continued. If the representative does continue to conduct themselves in such a disagreeable manner, I may have to revisit the contracts they hold with the government. The fake smile he plastered on his face was replaced by a stern, faux, fatherly gaze. I don't want to do this, Masaharu, but help me ensure I don't have to do this. Masashita gave a silent, chastised nod. His nose dug into his palms so deep that they were starting to draw blood. Would Kunosuke put up with this? Doesn't matter. He's not here right now. Uh, there you go. We're done. Someone has left a prime minister in Finland, but we don't care. Target markets? Well, we're already uh, marketing to Argentina, Chile, Kingdom, Italy, 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 Italy. Italy. Render under Kaiser, uh, a Caesar. Uh, drops of rainwater trickle down the window pane, cascading gradually and gently down the begrimed glass and absorbing into the slab of concrete below, paralleling the beads of frigid sweat flowing down Yamauchi's neck, soaking the colors on his business attire. The papers before him, roughly assembled upon his desk, caused his head to throb as he attempted to grasp a lamentable reality. His hands trembled with worry and regret. The rows and rows of paragraphs and reports coalesced into one incoherent mass in his fatigue and overburdened mind, akin to a pillar of immovable stone exerting its monumental pressure upon his fragile psyche. Look at this, yay. Uh, three successive knocks, knocks, which echoed endlessly through Yamauchi's ear canal, drawing his attention towards a small wooden door opposite his desk. Um, the crumbling businessman signaled for them to enter with an exhausted whimper, but the door promptly opened, or slammed open, revealing three figures dressed in the distinctive colors of the campai tie. Their expression stern and rigid. Weapons of suppression strapped to their sides. One man stepped forward and nonchalantly placed a document before Yamauchi, expectantly glaring towards him. Surrender of all private assets. Corporation with the Hitachi. Those are the only co uh, comprehensible uh, segments that Yamauchi could interpret before obscuring a mental miss return. He tried to protest. He wanted to speak his mind, but he could not. These men were not here for the reason. For reason. They're not here to negotiate. They were here to obtain a signature, and it was all that mattered. Panel was put to paper. The last semblance of hope and optimism draining the pitch black ink into the, onto the dotted line. The sound of falling raindrops were getting loud, and the skies overhead darkened. A storm would soon appear. A little fall of rain in the theater of security. The area began to buzz with activities. Speakers began to transport voices and music into the room, echoing off the walls of the cramped little flat. Sai sat lackadaisically upon his bed, listening to every word spoken by the figure of authority being blasted into the room, nodding his head slightly in agreement as a booming voice read the, the crimes of, of a cadre of dissident journals putting, him, putting on, being put on for trial for causing disorder among the populace. You listen to this, Sai shouted to one of his roommates, busy at work with, on a small clay sculpture. Yeah, the roommate replied, I think they ought to get what they deserve. Maybe this government ain't too bad. At least one has the decency to clean the filth off the streets, Sai replied, his eyes fixed on the antenna of the radio. His roommate, preoccupied with other tasks at hand, merely muttered a few words of agreement. As he continued to draw marks using a toothbrick of a slab on a slab of wet clay, the silence culminating with a loud bang of a gavel and the handing down of the sentence followed by ecstatic cheers. 
We'll be back to normal soon, so I thought. Soon. And then the radio switched off. Never can, never be seen again. As our efforts to comprehensively... Ooh, there goes Iberia. As our efforts to comprehensively expel all elements of descent from one pristine... But from the once pristine pearls continue to advance. Our plans for the compulsory relocation of the incarcerated dissidents need to be cemented alongside the progression of the other matters. While dislodging them to be the expansive rural regions of Guangdong may seem the most obvious and efficient solution, it does not completely achieve our purpose of keeping them from the public eye, as a rather meager size of our state and extensive amount of dissidents may lead to accidents which we would rather avoid. Um, uh, it has become apparent that the most viable and reasonable solution would be to contact our benefactors to the north, the Nissan Corporation, and the lucrative breadbasket of the Manchukuo, a bundle of the vacant territories and away from any unwanted prying eyes. Therefore, we will transport all captured dissidents and their families to the factories and fields of Manchukuo, where they will toil away beneath the guardianship of Nissan. Undoubtedly, this will strengthen their ties and grow our favorability with the largest backer, as well as effectively silencing the embers of dis disobedience once and for all. No need for dissidents, though the factories and mines of Manchukuo are hiring. Nice. Ah, this will give us a seat thing to do. Oh, we can do this one too. Oh, we've got more growth here. A model worth replicating. The operations undertaken by Nissan and Manchukuo have resulted in their immense growth and unprecedented generation of profits under the aegis of Meng Yo. Removing ourselves from further interaction with these brilliant businessmen would be no better than robbing Guangdao of a similarly grand future. Let's emulate Nissan's practice in the country as well as on the basis of their valued advice in order to attain the true prosperity that we seek. You will be forgotten. It was uh, the unmistakable clatters of plastic heels against the firm concrete floor that Wang Ping Ong jolted awake. Head still hazy and eyeballs still dry from a horror night sever sever uh, severed. Yeah, he couldn't tell how many pairs of boots were heading this way. Four or five? He tried his darndest to pry open his eyelids, but then came the shouts and the r rustling and yanking on the bruised scrawny arm, forcing him into the feet as if intending to tear him to shreds on the spot. He felt his hand slide into a row of iron bars, and sense finally fell it back to him. They were dragging him out of his cell. He was actually leaving that dark lemon cubicle heck on earth behind him. As he was escorted down the pitch black hallway, his mind flashed from the vivid scene to vivid scene. From the crudely made banners in the hands to the sirens and cordons encircling the campus to Adzit's uh, teary eyes and desperate wails as he hauled away from his by from his love by the thugs in khaki. As he marched on, he saw the end of the tunnel, the gleaming moonlight beckoning him from the other side. Perhaps it would all be over soon, his thoughts crescendo. It's only been five days after all, certainly soon enough for a complete recession of arrests. A truncheon blow rippled across his brain, and both his legs gave out at once. He dropped his knees, all remaining in his mind, a haze of stupefaction, and a deafening ringing in his ears blocking him from, from whatever the heck is being babbled on and on about. Treason. He can no longer make out a single sense. Guilty. He stared blankly at the carpet of weathered grass beneath him, showing an ivory, ghastly moonlight. Sentenced you to immediate execution. The last gold barrel of a nim nimbu injected one more instant of lucidity into a long ping-on before oblivion erupted from the back of his head and devoured him whole. Other name of the list. Ah, yeah, the H7830 text visualization interface. The dawn of the integrated circuit continues to advance computer technology at lightning speed. The latest innovation comes courtesy of Hitachi, the H7830, a television screen that, when attached to the computer, displays a lot of both the inputs and outputs of the computer's processing. This eliminates the need for printed outputs and makes coding much easier as errors can be spotted in real time. With so much added efficiency and ease of use, so surely see widespread adoption in the future. A computer with a screen, who would have thought? Beautiful. 25% real growth. It's a decent amount. Decent amount. Well, old machine, huh? Hey. No, the comment was yes, yes, yes. Kamai's dream of an efficient Guangdong shall be achieved, and those opposing him will be swept aside forever. Where are the punch cards? Uh, where do we put them? The overseer said, I'm before embarking on his exclamation for the tenth time today, it doesn't use those. Then how do we use it? The overseer felt a health day coming on. Close his eyes and remind himself how much the new Hitachi computers would increase efficiency. More efficiency was what the company desperately needed. The Italian shipping industry was growing faster and faster, and keeping up technological was a necessity. If only he could get his employees to understand it. B but how do you turn it on? Emergency Junta. And if you three of you wanted about that, please go right ahead. A killer's muscle's memory, huh? Houses of Terror. Hostage terror sounds like fun. <laughs> pre touch criminal investigation interrogation procedures were an utter farce. Too many summary executions, too much undeserved leniency given to those of sleazy rodents. One disgrace after another congregated an utterly disgusting failure of law enforcement. No more arrests don't deserve freedom. Arrests don't even deserve death. The only fate a captured rat deserves is scuttling on the hot coal or drowning in its own sandwich for eternity until it spews its innards out for us or also I'll never see the light of day again. Oh, this one next for so. Uh, Toriyatsu Kai Chui. Part of the Mangyo and success, as the most excellent chief executive is aware, that Mangyo Manchu Jukogyo Kaihatsu 
Kabushiki Gaisha, or the Mangyon Shore, was established by the Imperial Kwangtung Army to industrialize the Manchurian Empire and render itself sufficient in the heavy and eventually light industry. At the beginning, Mangyo wished to be the build of the success of the South Manchurian Railway Corporation and subsidiaries, such as the Showa Steel Works, however. Over the last two decades, Mangyo has made even though these great successes look pathetic by comparison. Mangyo has successfully transformed Manchuria into an economic powerhouse and the pearl of the co-prosperity sphere through a combination of ruthless industrialization, zealous development, and vigorous unremitting production. Mangyo has truly become an engine for the fulfillment of our ambitions. The Manchurian model is elevated and correct. What is needed is that we have come to Guangdong to promote it. What we need, and we have, precisely, to preoccupy ourselves with safety regulations or the welfare of the average worker. One need only ask the fallen states of Western Europe, which wasted their precious time and money bothering with such foibles. Where that has gone, look where that has gone them. We urge the chief executive to carry on unremittingly with just from Guangdong, taking Mang Yuo's an honorable and elevated example. I am only too happy to. Come on. Thanks, come on. 3.4, oh, that's not good. Crack down. But what will this do for us? Reduce the bureaucracy and clear up legal codes to allow increased investment from Tokyo and no, Nissan. More growth and decrease admin costs even further. Well, it's not a love. Superior approval. Um, I think I read this one before. If you're going to this, please go ahead. I think the Chinese are ignoring me. But then again, I probably ignore me too. But then going on. Happy October, everybody. And someone else says, uh, the gears keep turning, the Chinese sports cease to exist, and cash still flows still. So far, everything is perfect. I completely agree. There you go. Still so high, my god. Never to be seen again, and then far away, never to return. The most irritating man in the world. If you're into this, please go ahead. We're not going to get very far with him, are we? Honestly, probably not. House is a terror. Yes, sir. Casual conversation. The tick on the wall of the clock was the only sound that cut through the silence in Consul General Song's office. Assumed by the tap of Ken I Kenshiro uh, on fingers on the desk. Oh, I think I heard this one before, too. Read that one if you'd like. Far away, never to return. In the blackest of night, thunder cracked far out in the distance, and the rain pelted the concrete as hundreds of men were herded across the dockyards. The black shade hanging over the gloomy night sky hammered down on the shores and necks and seeped into the jumpsuits that clung to the aching bodies. These were the men first to be deported on the order of the chief executive for crimes against the state on course for a land that wouldn't offer them the mercy of the Komai did. Gathered in lines as the march towards the ships, the prisoners were packed into the hull of the grand vessels, grand metal structures bobbing in, in the crashing waves. Black as the night that swallowed their sorrow. One by one, they were packed in like sardines. Wailing and roaring the sound of whistles and bones cracking at the beat of a truncheon. Some lay on the floor hurling the guts, others shuddered against the cold metal frames of the interior, panicking and bellowing for the humanity. It mattered not, however, that their fate would have been decided at the flick of a pen only a few days prior, and the liners left from a chukwo at the piercing cry of a whistle. Oh, the sound that would slice through the grumble of thunder and misery of imprisoned men. Few of those vessels believed they would have survived the journey, and a few believed that they would have returned. Koma, ex his exchange with Shinkyo would be fruitful, he had a thought. When the order was signed, it only took a motion of a signature to scrap those pathetic souls from the cells they brought it in, and send them somewhere where their lives wouldn't be wasted, crumbling out away to descent filth. I will be forgotten. To descent filth. Utility of despair. Keep it a secret. Oh. Fair for Matsushita. Let's see. Utility to spare. I'm thinking we want to do keep it a secret. Oh, good morning, Matsushita. Trust you are welcome. I was grinning, turning up the charm all he could. His words dripping with plastic friendliness. His face was full of his fake sincerity. Matsushita was unimpressed. I prefer if you could just please get to the point, he said. Why did you call me here? You're here because I want to do you a favor, Kamai said. Earlier this week, I was informed that some of your packages are in need of more labor. It just so happens that our prisons contain many men who needed to find work. Kamai waited for Masashi's reaction, there was none, and the Hitachi man continued. We can redact these men your factors, of course, just say the word, we'll make it happen. Masashi's response was clear, of course, you would expect our support in the let go for your new ordinance. Naturally, nothing in this world is free, after all, Kamai offered Masashi to him. It's simple, you help me, I help you. Do you have a deal? Masashi thought of how to best respond. Make it happen? 
Uh, it's not an interest. Games are quite the affable creatures. They are easily predicted, uh, easily frightened, easily manipulated in doing researchers' bidding. We're the researchers pursuing the formula of Guangdong's Renaissance. Our society is a natural laboratory readily packed with witless, witless canine subjects and some more subverting, subverting than others. Oh. I want to do this one. Yeah, this one I want to do. Keep it secret. Oh, if you want to finish reading this one, please go ahead. But canines are quite the nuisance. They are easily provoked. Even with a step on the tail, they could send them flying into an irritating rampage. Couple that with a cancerous pack mentality, and in no time, humongous blocks of walking, barking flesh would congregate upon the sanctity of Guangdong soil. The only fitting way to dispose of them would be, therefore, be mouth euthanasia, which is not as e much as a squeal will be allowed out of those rabid wretches' mouths before they're put out of their misery. Crackling gunfire would have brought us the same number of bodies, anyways. Fair yeah, for the Fujitsu. Come on, this better be worth my time. Ibuka began the two of them. We're sitting in the chief executive's office after lunch. From the way the Fujitsu fidgeted, uh, chief fidgeted in his feet, it's good to not want to be here for my second longer than he needed to be. I'm sure that it will be, Kumai replied, somewhat slighted, as I mentioned earlier. I'd like to do you a favor. Many of our prisoners need work and understand Fujitsu has a number of positions open that they would need to fulfill. We can direct these manufacturers, of course. In exchange for votes in the let go, Ibuka interjected impatiently. I know how this goes. You're here to beg me for support for your new ordinance. Come on, I was taking it back, but eventually composed himself. A tone of condensation crept back into his voice. These, are peop these people are criminals, Ibuka. They're the very drugs of society, the lowest of the low. What do you certainly care for the well-being of them for? Well, there's a brief pause. Come on, I spoke to Phil in the silence. We both benefit from this deal. You get your cheap labor, I get my votes. Isn't that fair? The chief executive offered Ibuka his hand. I won't waste any more of your time. I understand you're busy. Give me an answer, yes or no. No, pass the ordinance yourself. I like how we're on the perspective of all everyone else but them. Wait, this is... back up. Yeah, we'll be nice. We'll do that. Two birds, one stone, was in the middle of a rather stated debate on the violent criminal control and incarceration ordinance when the chief executive Komai can ensure begin his uh, speech. Members of the LECO, uh, over the preceding weeks, we have heard many complaints about the state of labor in the Republic's factories. In particular, many of our companies claim to suffer from serious labor shortages. If you're truly concerned about this lack of labor, Komai continued, then let me propose a solution. We'll expand the list of crimes, include both political crimes and statements, slander, libel, criticism against any of the companies. Come on, I pause, examining the crowd, a couple of raised eyebrows, a few whispers, but overall they appear somewhat interested. That was a good sign, it would not be difficult to expand at all, and this will provide our prisons with more than enough men to fill your factories. A murmur began from around the hall, that clearly got their attention. Come on, consider whether to push through this amendment or not. Show there's no point. Expands the reach of the ordinance to also cover political dissenters who are threatening the stability of the Guangdong. I think that's fair to do, yeah. More growth, yeah. Increases public meetings which are outlawed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's fantastic. Medici, huh? Is that how you pronounce it? Look at that. Is that cigarette or taparello or something? Someone says, can you make a Millennium Dawn campaign with Armenia? I've not played Millennium Dawn in a long time. I'm going to say probably not. But you never know someday. Maybe. 3.5, not bad. 7.7, 45 billion in growth. Come on, Kenichiro. Guangdong Savior. Yeah, that's what we'll say. Guangdong Savior. House of Terror, keep it a secret. Oh, you bet we will. A million bowed heads. When they know fear, we will know peace. Look down, huh? But we're going to read about uh, a paper trail here in just a little bit. We'll spend a little more money, but, you know, whatever. It is what it is. You got to spend a little money to make a lot of money, but no exit. In theory, Officer Lam was supposed to be on guard duty, staying alert for any radicals or troublemakers that might disturb Guangdong's peace and stability. In reality, his eyes were fully transfixed when the scene unfolding in front of him. Right at the moment, the prisoners were being heralded by the chains into large unmark unmarked white vans. The captains were all quiet, shuffling despondently along to their fate. Camp Ponta agent showed, shoved any stragglers into the vehicle, barking orders to the police to keep order and control and to make sure that not a single soul interfered with this operation. Lamb knew that no one, anyway, since everyone uh, knew that anyone who defied his statute faced severe punishment. Earlier that day, Lamb helped to apprehend two of them. They were just some fresh-faced boys caught vandalizing a government building. They were certainly not hardened criminals and didn't deserve this. As they dragged past him, he felt a deep red shame. He couldn't look directly at him. You can barely look him in the eyes. They were Chinese too, just like him, and now they're on a direct journey to cold, barren brew of Manchuria, where they would certainly face a horrific fate. A question emerged in his brain, a single word that he couldn't ignore. Why? Why was he still doing this? Why was he still serving this wicked evil regime? Lamb contemplated leaving the force for a moment. It was only for a moment since he realized that whether he wanted to say it or not, the evil was already done. Whether he liked it or not, Officer Lamb Hyal Suan was responsible for this, but he'd never be able to wash the hands of the blood off of his hands. Paper trail, uh, why am I here? The man abused with a tone of rage, seemingly to conceal an obscure emotion, was went unanswered by the armed men standing before him. He sealed in the room against his will, locked with himself in his fate. He attempted to stand up, which was not met, which was met by a swift and harsh reaction or action from the guards, sending him back down on the chair with a hefty push. The man, brimming with conflicting feelings of confusion, anger, and worry, began to merely stare at the captors, awaiting a response or a reprimand. When a thing arrived, he spoke once more, I have places to be, a family to attend to, work that needs to be done, his voice filled with uncertainty and a slight hint of fear. The urge remained indifferent, upholding the eerie and uncanny silence with in the interrogation rooms. 
One of the men tightened his lips, furrowing his eyebrows, and looked directly towards the seated man. He could feel the terror and anxiety swelling within him. Was it the time he snuck some parts out of the factory? Was it when he derided his manager with his colleagues behind his back? His mind tried to jump towards well, all the conclusions he could muster, dismissing one after the other. It had to be one of them. A sum on the table. When the officer released his hand, all that remained was a piece of paper. One that sunk his heart to the deepest depths fathomable. The words presented themselves boldly, uh, proudly identifying themselves as a union. Campaign for the rights of the workers, urging others to join and participate. The man slowly raised his head, an expression of the contempt now clear in a single one of his captors. Before he could realize it, a punch barreled towards his abdomen. A cry of pain ensued. Such are the consequences. I forgot we did this one too. Crap. I can do, this, do these ones. More corruption. Remove the last environment regulations that are obstructing Wang Gong's growth. I do like more money. In your name only. This gives you more growth. A million bowed heads, huh? In your name only. If we took additional steps of offering these on exclusive contracts, the standards of services offered by them and, and save us a significant amount of money while strengthening our relationship with our reputable and distinguishing partners. It's not just a necessity to work along Nissan. It is a privilege, and offering those contracts to them can only benefit our economic development. Contracts Nissan, nice. More stability, too. I showed this one earlier. And more growth. I love it. The Hitachi ecosystem will be added to our assorted laws, of course. Ah, beautiful. Zero percent zero percent support. And we got like four guys here who are Zujian who support us too. Not bad. Expats, well they mostly almost all love us. You wrote about nineteen fifty five, please go right ahead too. Here. 70? Yeah, probably. Four days left. Well, we go. Oh, Terrace attack. Blast sucks, Italy. Sucks for you. Sorry. Huh. Oh, where the watchmen walked. Oh, where prisoners had lain crowded on the linoleum floor. They are nowhere to be found now. As if a divine hand plucked the recent jails clean and left them spick and spam. The criminal element was eliminated from the world without noise or disturbance. Lamb found them quite disturbing. Black motorcades ro rode low, hunched. People clad in black and whose arms bore the purple armband of mourning passed, eh, walked past in funeral parades, marching and marching. Knock on the door was always the same. A long-suffering spouse, child, or mother. In combinations of those elements greeted with tears of body bags that Lamb delivered under their doors. Muttering, sorry, sorry, gets the tears of fervent sorrow and rage. A pandered gash, a tore and tore day in and day out. With steely eyes, who delivered men and women whose hands he had cuffed in the gar guarantee of surrender to the horses wearing khaki-clad uniforms. Mercy was a form of virtue, for we were at war. Over the neighborhoods, we were laughter flowing high into the whim. Where the bickering and the fights had aired out in low booms of wrath, and here the silence settled. After it all, after these draining shifts, he entered his patrol car, too afraid to leave, too afraid to stay. With trembling fingers, he drank thimblefuls of mineral water from his bottle, cold and harsh against the parched, dry lips. Let, let the keening silence end, he prayed. And when I'm gone, who's, over, who's to watch over me? More than just a guest. And in the Nissan Corporation, we see not a tool nor expendable supplier for us, accessory for growth, but instead a reliable and trustworthy economic partner, and a patron that will guide us towards the and the past gates of prosperity. Nissan is an organization that has proven to be of extreme benefit to us, and has aided and supported us in our previous endeavors of economic reorganization, and assisted us in generating profits and capital that we could not have imagined. A sizable portion of the, of the desirable credit of Guangdong's success under the administration of Hitachi rightfully belongs to Nissan, achieving and accomplishing more for our benefit than any other existing entity aside from Hitachi and the chief executive himself. It's evident that we must ensure that a productive partnership must continue to proliferate in Guangdong's future. And, as if to ma be maintained, uh, it'll bring upon us an endless era of pro uh, prosperity and plentiousness. Underneath Sun Machuko's guiding, guiding hand, Guangdong sees the lights of Asia's future. Down the telephone wire, voting on the entrepreneurial recovery ordinance will ha commence. It'll happen in 20 days. Beautiful. Yeah, you got another one too. Nice. Oh my god. How much do we need? 45 billion? I hope we beat that. Oh, 46 billion. Oh god, how's this bad? It's a little bit of surplus, no? Not great, not bad. 9% growth only, that's it. That's not good enough. Detached obstinance, severe approval, you want to do that? Please go ahead. And as took wishes, how ridiculous. Um, honestly, I want a little more approval. And we've got more than enough seats, right? We have 55 seats, and they're going to give us some corruption anyways, eventually, too, to get rid of it. Executive privilege. Kamai walked into a semi-formal catch-up with other tycoons expecting a fight. You can see on their faces, resentment, fear. They must have read his latest decree. Masashida wore a deep frown, but then it amused Kamai more to see the open fear in Upoka and Morita. Gentlemen, Kamai said, taking a seat, let's get started. 
I trust you've all attended a really recent announcement. Everyone has a book of spell of the words as if they were poisoned. I've been on the phone for the, with my legislators, trying to calm them down, but there's nothing I can say that will make them feel better about this. I agree. Marita said, this isn't something we can brush away with a few words. A lot of the let go are where they are because of their work on the government contracts, which... Which you're taking away, Buka Cutin. Slamming his fist on the table. Exclusive contracts to Nissan? We all know there's going to be subcontractors to Hitachi. What do you think you're doing, Komai? You're cutting out experienced managers on crucial government contracts. Oh, Komai's eyes shone with delight. If they have any concerns, though, they're free to bring such valuable experience to the Nissan family. Something harsh and wordless escaped Ibuka's throat. Marita stared at Komai's, fuming and impotent. Komai turned to silent Masashita. His lips were so pursed, but Komai wondered if he was chewing on them to stay silent. They're all furious, but there was no finding this. It was entirely within the chief executive's purview to sign government contracts. Not even Lutko could interfere with this administrative privilege, but none of them expected its abuse to be so brazen. Sucks to suck. A million bowed heads. A police state. A humanitarian, humanitarian hellhole. Such are the dozens upon dozens of condemnations conjured up and lobbied at us by the weak-hearted hypocrites rushing upon their own mountains of loot across the lands and seas. To those adversaries, we testify, all are true, and in this place we would take utmost unrepentant pride. But what are duteous children, if not su subjects to the harshest of floggings, to the harshest of discipline? What does it become the, of the Pan-Asian man, where he is to succumb to the greatest vice of all and defile himself with treachery? The rising sun, of course, permits no such error. Up above in the ferment she gleams, and delivers her crimson rays upon every obedient citizen, every turning cog, of course, and every bar of gold to grace his oasis of prosperity, and those who dare to defy her light, only scorches, only scorched bones will remain. Absolutely. Happy February, everybody. Down the telephone wire, huh? Down the telephone wire. 47 billion is not enough, though. I can review. Let's get back to work. Hey, I guess a little bit more too. Ooh, 5% nice. Now we can burn it then. Oh, yeah, I'm going to burn it all. Screw it. In the early hours of the morning, as the midnight, midday, midnight lunar glare hang over the obsidian sky, and as if the twink sky city's twinkling lights freckled the skyline, Komai swung back in his chair with a tele oh, phone line cable reaching all the way to his right ear. His stretched body revealed his tie ivory shirt. He usually hid within his ink black suit, nearly buttoned up, and his tie hanging over to one side as he relaxed in his office. Komai so, uh, spoke slowly into the phone, unlike me, grunting quietly with one arm raised to pat his gray head of hair. He remembered short responses in between moments of silence. He was on the phone to a representative Nissan from within Manchu Quo. They spoke for a short while. Each of Kumai's senses were strung together with aqu aquiline precision. His voice, tired and coarse, muttered with simple congratulations and gratitude to his economic partner. After all that's been done, I'll have told Tarasi to get this illustrious nation back to work. I thank you for your part in this. Guangdong will get our industrious, industrious roots uh, under my premiership. Riches will flow down this river like never before, of course. After the short condemnation and flush of exhaustion, a great gust of air escaped Kumai's lungs once he had hung up, and the ache in his tense shoulders released. A few minutes passed where all he could do was stare at the air in front of him, uh, unhunched over his desk and immobilized by his fatigue, a flickering the, uh, until the flickering neon fluorescent of the city had seized his arrested attention. The peace of success uh, is fleeting but satisfactory. Oh yes. Absolutely. Alright. Well, only 9% growth, like I said. It really kind of sucks. Especially when you're used to like 25%. Oh my god. We need more growth. More growth. Zero waste, my friends. Come on, can't you up poor waste? You do not mean to waste in the traditional sense. The plush leather sofas procured for a ruinous sum of public funds were a welcome source of comfort. You know, qualms over spending two months' salary for a tailored suit, nor do you feel much more than a mild distaste of this slight set of garbage bags piled upon each other in the street. They all had a purpose, or it served them to their natural conclusion. They deserve some respect. You know their purpose have been to be consumed and discarded. Well, then could Kamai say about the vagrants and beggars who litter the streets of Guangdong? Nothing. Taking and consuming for themselves without any contribution of their own in return. Not that they had much to offer, at least if they had. Sure, they would have avoided their miserable fate. The entrepreneurial recovery ordinance could help, Kamai suppose. He had been toying with adding a provision for zero-hour contracts, allowing an employer to hire someone purely at four at well tasks, with no obligations for minimum hours of pay. It had been a popular among his managers, who didn't like the prospect of a workforce that could be paid less and abused more. No, he had hoped he had gone unnoticed, it had gone unnoticed by the king. Kamai demonstrated his worth, his worth in extracting every ounce of labor from his new fiefdom. All that remained of was passing the Leko, a body that he hoped would prove more useful than wasteful. Leko could prove their, else, their worth on something else. Guangdong must be pruned of weeds. Add zero hour contracts. Implements contracts in a contain a cap on the amount of work hours a week. Nice. One million is a statistic. 
Dogs, rats, maggots. All we have expendables are apprehensible vermin form from every corner on our map. With fewer than hundreds left walking and tainting this earth, how have we dutifully channeled the arsenal of terror, disciplined ourselves with chains of bullets, and suffocated ourselves with waterboards, and called upon whatever vicious gadgets and unforgiving measures Guangdong so dearly demands of us? Because of who we are to turn our backs on the wells of distress, to sit idly by the side of our diseased physique, pale, emaciated, yet eternally pregnant with riches. Even as the stars turn and the years elapse, so many remain... Uh, who would decry our righteousness and devotion as cruelty, tyranny, and barbarism. All we did was come to Guangdong aid and protect her, as we continue to until the day our souls expire against the ghastly and all-devouring night. Back and call. Come on, sir, to the podium, his eyes dispassionately scanning the lines of his speech. He already memorized it, but the speech was more important and more useful to him than the men of the legislative council. He already advanced Javi's interests more uh, in the time he'd been in the power than the rest of his men in their whole gosh darn lives. It was almost formality at this point, but it was one that I had no issues with fulfilling. Come on. Diverted his eyes away from the speech, making them look at the men uh, before him when he began to speak. I and my associates at Hitachi, he began, proposed an amendment to the entrepreneurial recovery ordinance that shall soon go to vote. That should have counseled remained silent, not bothering even with a murmur. <clears throat> um, all their rapt attention was focused only on Kamai and what he had to say. Kamai expressed a smirk. They knew who was in charge and who was important, who was important in Guangdong. These amendments, come on, continue, would allow for the creation of zero-hour contracts. These contracts would enable corporations to summon an adequate workforce at any time, and for any reason, which of course would lead to market increases in productivity across the board. Out of the corner of his eye, Mar Kumai saw Marita, that weak, bleeding heart, scowl in the barely disguised disgust. Kumai almost sneered. He was too weak to do what was necessary to advance Japanese interests. He was so busy trying to make himself fit in here that he had forgotten about his Japanese roots and his duties to the Japan. He expressed his anger. Kumai looked around at the rest of the legislative council to find another man, including Matsushini Buko, staring at him with a discernible sense of helplessness like door in their faces. They all knew that resistance to Kamai, and by extension, Japan was futile. They know who their true masters are, as they should. Roughly three political power a day. Beautiful. 3.237 is not good enough. We need to do better. Zero percent. That's a growth. And monthly Chinese government support, but whatever. Quarterly growth of tried influence in each affected region. Oh, that's not good. The challengers, god damn, I hate the challengers. We only have 59 seats, come on. Look down, a logobrious blanket of souls. Um, or clouds hung above the streets and alleyways of our former Guangdong. Once the lively cities have been uh, engulfed in an atmosphere of melancholy and despondency. The sun radiating golden rays of lucent lights, shining with a brilliant, bri blazing br brightness that brought forth hope and optimism no longer illuminated the fatigued faces of thousands of workers and employees, obscured by the prevailing summer gloom. Men and women gathered on the sidewalks, walking uniformly to their place of employment, bearing expressions of exasperation and weariness. A group of commuters shuffled past a seemingly rather inconspicuous alleyway, however. The pace seemed to increase. Their heads all bowed as if trying to not attract unnecessary attention. The reason for such haste was quickly revealed as a small detachment of men dressed in coarse khaki uniforms and adorned with distinctive white armbands emerged from the concealing shade, their faces stern and rigid. Such was the nature of the daily commute, a fundamental tradition of Guangdong's corporate culture, now devoid of what little life and energy it once possessed in the days of the past. The prevalent emotion had became a united sense of unwavering dread, certainly a result of the morose environment that now defined Guangdong society. As the populace of Guangdong raised their heads and fixed their gazes to the grim and colorless sky, any hope uh, for the return of vivid sunlight gradually dissipated into the air, scattered with a cold breeze. A forlorn future. Nice. And Miracle on the Pearl River. At long last, four years of labor. Long, long years. Four painstaking years to cleanse Guangdong of savagery and bring her back into the, ri the rising sun's light now. She soars higher and prouder than ever before above the pitch black clouds, pitch dark clouds of ignorance and complacency. Her immaculate wings powered by the blood and sweat of the inferiors and every single imbecile daring to stand in the way of true emancipation. We thank you, wise chief executive, for showing us the way and leading a crusade against... <coughs> The omnipresent grasp of degeneracy. We thank the diligent man of Itachi for restoring us to our limitless wealth Guangdong so rightfully deserves. And above all, we thank the most loyal of our citizens, men or women, young or old, for taking their stand against the rabid ducks, conspiring to take away from us the glorious, unprecedented golden era of ours, one of prosperity and one of righteous harmony. Ten thousand years to his majesty, the emperor, and his eternal benevolence. To the everlasting glory and the fraternity of Dai Tua Yo Kai Ken. Kui, kui ken. Banzai, Banzai, Banzai. Kumai has not just changed Guangdong, it is a Guangdong built in his and Manchu Kuo's grand ambitions. Beautiful. We can burn a little bit more favor, can we? God dang it. No, we won't we will get there. 2.3, less than 3 billion, not bad. Inflation's okay, not great. I have more days for the products I call. Two months. And if you want to read by 1956, please go ahead. Truth bleeds into fiction, real bleeds into unreal. 
Did it wrong with China's color change? It seems like it did. Meet Japanese representatives? Yes, we will. A thousand hands. I'd right. Uh, last I drove myself to death. I wonder how many of us are in this tiny, tiny part of the city. Last I remember. There are 500 in this building. I wonder how many are just like me, but just like us in other cities in the entire country. Here in the building are a thousand hands that men in the factories to the brink of death. Here in this building are hundreds of people like me who survive only by the blocks of instant rum, and I cannot even taste what minimal flavor there is in packouts anymore, or packets anymore. There's a lot of time to enjoy myself for the moment, let alone rest. When I can rest, it only takes a moment for me to hear a cacophony of sound screaming, the footsteps of the police, items thrown, desperate pleased by young and old alike. How much more must our thousand bodies be beaten into our bone shatter and they are no more? How much more must I dream of, our, of the police coming to me for having these thoughts until and those dreams being interrupted by the subject? Unit 127, above my unit 117, is being raided as I write this. Their screams haunt me. The pleas by the, the children and parents are plastered like wallpaper everywhere I see in the factories. On the facades of buildings, on the very walls that surround me right now, I cannot help but think, what if I spare myself the inhumanity now? There's a window to my right. I know more than who have taken the path I'm talking about, even more though who did not want to. The person who was my previous neighbor, I wish I learned his name, jumped. Another used knives. One more went to the river. All I want to go is anywhere but here. So do I. You know, I once wanted to sing. How can I do so now when I bear witness of horror all around me? I can only sing of horror. Horror to which I live. Horror to which I wish to die. The most irritating man in the world and unwelcome advice. Night terrors. Why well, starts up suddenly in her bed, a uh, tense to panicky mess. Her jaw trembles, her breathes are heavy, her strained. She almost screams, but seeing the familiar four walls of her room just about manages to stifle it. Immediately she jolts her head over the side, and there she finds a dawn's pale light on Chun and Hay. Both still fast asleep. Still both here at least, and she calms slightly. It was the same nightmare again, the one that had appeared in her dreams a few weeks ago and never left her night since. The screaming they always came first, from either Chun or Hay, sometimes both. They'll be choking, controlled, each of them held down by a horde of armed black shadowy men. Itachi Goons or Camp I didn't matter. The brothers would always call out to Y, pleading, begging for her to help. All the while she'd be helpless, every muscle of fiber frozen. She watched as the men chained her, their every limb, making sure they couldn't escape. She couldn't look away as the men yanked them away into the darkness. And that was where it always ended. Why completely thoroughly alone, crying for her long vanishing brothers. Sometimes the dream was so palpable, but it's vivid, so vivid, that it was difficult to tell the real from the unreal. At least they were both asleep now. It was fitful, yes, but she knew that she needed they needed anything they could get, especially for Chun, since one sided one side sleep to provide mistake to the next unsafe machine and cost him his life, and so Wyatt curls back under her own thin covers. Trying to feel any warmth as she can, feeling the tears on her cheeks, but trying not to sob, trying not to close her eyes. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. Yeah, I know. Imagine get, being able to get to sleep at night. That'd be that's totally not relatable. Not stressed out or anxious or anything like that. Totally not. But you know, whatever. Hey, better dust for peace. Yeah, there's some good out of this the good. This is all good. It's all good. Innovative industry, the party's over. The match is worn off, Yoshiko thought, perhaps the trappings were of the same, but the veneer of the party is peeling. The band was thinner, and then in times past, it played slower, more downbeat. The laughter, previously unrestrained, is now dispensed cautiously, and the opera voice is just a pitch lower as of all Guangdong's Japanese League dance and night away, tiptoeing around the enormous elephant that stood him right in their faces. But then there will be no hedging, no middle ground. You either work with Itachi, as many did while greeting their teeth, or you prepare to leave for the home islands, departing with the face saving excuses of better opportunities back home. By the time an older woman in a garish pink number approached her Yoshiko, found the conversation increasingly tiresome, but the older woman spoke first, and politeness compelled Yoshiko to stay. Hello, Yoshiko. Oh, I'm leaving so soon. That's fine. We'll just catch up back in Japan, then I'll whenever you're back. None of the shots an option for me, Yoshiko replied. What little family I have there doesn't want to see my face. The older woman's face suddenly changes. She frowns, and her eyebrows raise in what is an unobvious concern. Her face darted from left to right, and her voice dropped to a whisper. You know it's not safe here, she said. We're surrounded, outnumbered by them. If they didn't hate us before, they certainly do now. It's better to be with your own people. And who's responsible for that, Yoshiko wanted to say. What a complete farce. But she kept her thoughts to herself. Gave the older woman a small and sincere smile and said, Thank you for your advice, but I think it's better for me to stay. And see what happens. It's May. It's May, 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 May. We have two weeks until the parodic cycle. We don't need more political power. I just want to cut down the debt, man. 4.000009%. 100% centralized. I like how we can see this up here too. The belts. And the canal. Straight to Gibraltar. Oh. Adlanthropa. I miss you. Huh. Israel's pretty thick. Brick to marble. Come on, Kenichiro stood atop a colossal skyscraper, soaring above the buildings and streets. 
present on the ground. Around his hour, the maelstrom of a vibrant and kaleidoscopic neon lights that was kosher began to animate itself, accompanied by the chatter and footsteps of workers and employees returning to their modest residences, and continuing upon the mundane routines from up here. The thousands of people below seemed uh, Lilliputian to Komai, insignificant morsels and specks that only lived to serve a system and purpose more than grand and noble than their own livelihoods. His mind went adrift with a calming evening breeze, landing upon memories of the Guangdong he had once inherited, a strange land besmirched and deprived by the apathy and lenience of his in in inattentive predecessors, men like the lethargic Suzuki, the puppet that was Matsuzawa. Kuma peered, peered once more towards the distant horizon for a feeling of accomplishment. He rose the Guangdong from the grasp of inefficiency, utterly exterminated and expunged any notion of descent from the hinterlands of the Three Pearls. It was a bring of enlightenment, akin to Prometheus bringing the gift of fire. An allowable administration of Hitachi had transformed Guangdong's operational apparatus and resuscitated her economy, creating a glorious miracle upon the banks of the Pearl River. The memories of his commendable achievements had slowly subsided in his mind, and his thoughts now centered upon the most important matter of all the future. Under his auspices and authority, he may now have initiated the process of Guangdong's necessary transformation, yet it is still far from complete. As Kumai turned it around and prepared to descend the symbol of the descendancy, Ascendancy. An old quote appeared in his mind, a quote that illustrated the prosperity that his deeds have brought thus far. A, quite spoke, a quote spoken by a man whose career paralleled his own. I found Rome of the earth, a city of bricks, and left it a city of marble. The past and the future. The center cannot hold. The dinner host hosted that night at an upmarket restaurant in the Japanese district of Koshu, untouched by the disturbances still plaguing larger parts of the country. Kano Miyazaki is happy with Kumai concessions and locks it with Mang Yo Nisa. They've been authorized to stamp out dissent by any means necessary. Juno Nagano agrees with Miyazaki's assessment, predicting that China's resistance will dissipate as soon as they are reminded that Japan is not to be trifled with, of course. They adapt after the war, he says, and they will adapt again. Consul Juno Takashima nods, that's a glass of wine, says nothing. He knows it's not Japan, but the Chinese will come to fear, but their army, millions of bayonets, eviscerating anything that stands in the way, just as the Japanese themselves had learned to fear them. A few miles away, China's Consul General Song is also indulging in drinking with one of his aides, Wang Jingzhu, but out of despair rather than celebration. Song never saw the horrors of Manchukuo in the 30s, but he can see them here now. Kumai is turning the country to abattoir. Nanjing is doing nothing besides giving Kumai the occasional light reprimand. Wang suggests scaling up operations in Guangdong. So far, their attempts to help the Chinese population have proven inadequate. It's time to consider more direct measures, he says. Song without speaking nods. Guangdong is pulled ever deeper into the abyss. But we have the Hitak 10 mini computer. High performance. Has a wide variety of applications. As we just want to make sure we're as successful as possible, of course. Oh, yes. Corrupt officials, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Approval's very high, which we'll need. Oh, I didn't need to click on that one. Whoops. Oh, well, whatever. It's, ooh, the barking falls silent. This concludes the last of the affairs attached for discussion. My, would you look at that? We're 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Does anyone have anything to add? In this way, Kamai concluded the latest of many meetings of assembled tycoons at Guangdong. This meeting, like many recently, have been less of a forum for open discussion, for of ideas, and more of a rubber stamp. As an assembly intended merely to inform them of what the plan was and nothing more. Also, we grabbed a cup of lemon tea here, too. Looking slowly across the room, Kamai noted a few familiar faces in particular. Marita looked tiredly at the floor, having seemingly tuned Kamai out entirely. Matsushita sat with his arms crossed, gaze turned towards the wall in some hope of a small act of contempt, while Buka alone stared back at Kamai en enigmatically. Never been able to understand that Manny Buka, always endlessly strange, but in a matter not so long as so long as obeyed. They both knew he had little choice in that matter, just as like the rest of them. At last, Kamai allowed himself to smile. That, this is what it meant to rule. Rather than merely govern, for all the residents, the resistance he had faced at the start, it was remarkable how much more smoothly everything ran when everyone knew their place. I see. Thank you for all coming. This meeting is hereby adjourned. He dances in the middle of the corpses and laughs at the resentment. Nice. Life goes on. Life of Guangdong goes on its own way. It always has and always will. This does not mean most people experiencing this life are able to enjoy it. In Guangdong cities, the people shuffle by each other with few to no words. Too numb by fear and paranoia to hold a conversation. It's actually billboards and government loudspeakers proclaim to for all here the benefits of Pan-Asian cooperation. People have learned to ignore the billboards and tune out the loudspeakers, but they're not truly here to inform the masses of opportunity. They're here to humiliate and warn of the omnipresent nature of Hitachi. When they're able to, people speak to each other exclusively in hushed tones. And when they're not, they say only what is strictly necessary. The markets conduct business within eerie sounds, watched closely by the camp type patrols and frequently interrupted by the passing of police and military vehicles. Uh, the rural settlements uh, scattered across Guangdong are governed by a slightly different policy. Curfews are strict and orders secured by force. And anybody who disagrees with this quickly disappears. Security checks are conducted on those boarding trains or buses headed for cities, and none dare to struggle against this. In Guangdong, it attaches certainly established order in the life of the average person and very, with very little ease. It is of the order of the worst kind. Oppressive. Beautiful. 10%? Well, it's better. 3.7, not great. 4% no, inflation. Ah. 100%. And we need 
12 and a half. Which, I guess we overkilled it again. But, you know, whatever. Happy July, everybody. We'll get there. You have my promise. And we've a little less than two months, so which is more than fine. 66%. My god. That's just so much corruption. And we're just waiting here to see what's going to happen next. You never know what might happen next, but, uh... 12 and a half, huh? There you go. So that's 12 and a half. All we needed was 12 and a half, right? Yes. And we're marching, marketing towards the Greta German Reich. Which would be great at this point. 1957, you wonder about that, please go ahead. And after this one, we'll do this one. Flexible auto auto automation techniques. One. A billion is a plus. Oh, it's still going out. That's not good. Hey, 1.24%. More than double than we, what we had earlier. And we have like two guys that support us. And then, no, not, not, not good enough. That makes me feel a little better, but still not great, obviously. Yeah, no wonder it's a little higher now. A full billion, huh? But we're just kind of hanging out, waiting. The Hitak 10 microcomputer. The first computer to be truly portable. Hitachi's new Hitak 10 microcomputer takes advantage of advancements and in integrated circuits to pack the power of a basic mainframe computer into a package small enough to be steadily and easily transported by a single person. Fascinating. What well, doesn't need to be attached to large system machines or processors, which limits its commercial appeal to industry and research uses. The fact that a functional computer can be made of such a small size represents a serious step forward. Also, the first computer built to support Shogun. Well, Sphere's first widely available simplified programming language. This allows HitTech 10 to be customized to meet each individual's user needs. Soon we'll be putting them in our pockets. Yeah, huh, go figure. Lower our approval with Japan, but you know, whatever. With 27, almost 29% growth, can we really complain? Yes, we can. We can do better than that. But at this point, like I said, like I said we're just kind of waiting for a... Uh, no crisis to occur. That's right. No crisis will occur ever. Not under Kamai Konichiro. But I want to read about the German event, too. Yeah, Kingdom of Siberia versus uh, USSR. Oh, boy. The build back better. The Tachi way. Kamai Konichiro forced a pleasant smile on his face as he watched Minister Ehad agonizingly review the more than 100 pages of proposal Hitachi submitted to the Reich's Ministry of Economics on the importation, importation of construction equipment. How do it seem like an eternity of silence? The minister looked up. The ministry will have to conduct further reviews of the proposal. It appears uh, sound from my initial part inspection, however. Keep in mind that all offered equipment will be first be subjected to independent qualification testing before they can be approved for use on state-sponsored construction projects. Come on, struggle to hold his tongue. He knew very well that Hitachi's construction equipment exceeded the quality of their German counterparts on every possible metric, and from the very thought that the Reich would doubt their handiwork made his blood boil. Still, he can afford to let the mask slip this deep into the belly of the beast. With Germany in the middle of an unprecedented economic boom as a result of the Fuhrer and Erhard's policies, her domestic construction industry was left unable to keep up with demand. It's actually the once in a lifetime opportunity to enter the German market by selling some construction equipment or even taking on construction contracts themselves. Once again, Kamal was needed to play the gentleman. For the good of the Hitachi, for the good of Guangdong, and for the good of the Empire. Minister Erhard, it's been an honor to be granted this audience. Aftershocks. Even if the fires of the Middle Eastern oil fields were a world away from Guangdong, the facts were so palpable in the media. Plastics, that water material so useful in insulating into electronics and absorbing the heat generated by Guangdong's mirror product catalog. When the flow stop of oil, the oil will stop. The hoarding began first by companies that could see the storm approaching, then by the average consumer when the average price had risen. So, if we need the rest of this, please go ahead, but the machine comes to a halt in the end. Another decade, another disaster from the Pearl River. The Chinese workers, the Republic of China, and the Zhujian middlemen will no longer stand for Hitachi's oppression. And it sets our political power to 500, which is completely unfair to us, but whatever. Guangdong thirst. Guangdong, an entity defined by our immaculate serenity and the delightful omnipresent aura of prosperity. A paragon of economic stability and success, the pinnacle of social concord and solidarity. I must ensure that this image of Guangdong, an image of triumph and success, is protected and upheld with diligence against the destructive forces lingering around our state. The ocean of global markets is stirring with intensified vigor, the temp uh, tempestuous and turbulent waves threatening to engulf the pristine pearl of Guangdong in perpetual darkness as the supply of oil plummets, threatening the livelihoods of our devoted citizens. Though the drastic increase in oil price may only seem like a temporary issue, barely affecting the daily happenings of society as of current, it's apparent that if this affair is indeed to be a prolonged crisis, the three pearls will be devastated and the economic stability of Guangdong will be in peril. Our chief executive and the administration will conceive of solutions to this looming disaster in order for Guangdong to maintain her grace and decency and her coffers must be f remain fulfilled. The ship of Guangdong shall survive this endeavor, for there's no storms we cannot weather, and good times and bad that the master provides. As it should. Trial by fire. 
As the shadow of another crisis looms over the territories and businesses of Guangdong, its gas and horrendous uh, form causing the decline of so many of our prized institutions, our chief executive, Kilmai Kinichiro, must again must take the, up the burden of state and clear the obstructions in Guangdong's glorious and righteous path to continue to triumph and success. Did the great men of yore not have to face challenges in their ascent to promise and power? Did Caesar, Alexander, and Napoleon not have to face adversities on their own path to grandeur and victory? Well, Christ shall not be Kumai's Waterloo instead, and shall act as Kumai's Austerlitz, a trial of endurance and benefit of the administrative apparatus that our chief executive has bestowed upon us, another obstacle to surmount that will further prove the success of Hitachi's rule over the Three Pearls. The administration and our chief executive shall be ready. It might not be easy. It might not be smooth. But we shall emerge from the flames and emboldened and strengthened. The future ahead of us. Guangdong will survive. It touches Guangdong, though, or Komai's. Sounding the alarm. One early morning. An army of bureau of salad men rushed into the office of the manager, who, until that moment, relaxing quite comfortably. The manager looked up with eyes, wide eyes on, on rushing businessmen. Oil prices are skyrocketing, one of the salary men shouts. The investors are shorting. The salary men leaned over to the manager's desk, waiting breathlessly for his response. The manager stared at them quizzically. Then the danger registered, and he fell out of his chair in the mass scramble for the phone. The first domino falls. Ill news. An aide handed Komai Kansai's typer and page. The title read, Government Report. Effects of the oil crisis on the Guangdong stocks. The news was dire. Now, the crisis is already causing a severe downturn in stock prices. On the worse than the longer things went on like this. The report projected that many businesses would be shuttered even if the crisis were remediated. Komai heaved a great sigh. We must push on with the resolve, he said. There's no one in particular. Will the resolve be enough on the shoulders of the one man? Komai can ensure can help but feel he'd been tapped by the fate ends of fate. All great men in all great countries must face a great adversity. How else can they prove their quality? As the economic throes of the oil crosses rippled across the world, Komai became more and more convinced that he, this was his moment. The moment he would prove his strength and thereby Guangdong's. He alone set the throne of blood and iron, and he alone would be the man who carries his country through the great ordeal. Cutbacks would be necessary. Mass firings or temporary reductions in output would have to be instituted across the uh, country before the oil shortage struck. A great strain would be placed upon the people, but ultimately it would be all for the better. Komai would say Guangdong because Komai was Guangdong. This was his moment. An economy besieged. Chief Executive Kumai is of the view that further failure to pass more comprehensive economic measures is unjustifiable given the gravity of the current situation. Accordingly, it is directed that the budget be frozen before return to pieces. We have no choice, no matter what we try, no other measures will suffice to stabilize the economy and ensure our hegemony over Guangdong persists. It may raise eyebrows among investors, but the times are desperate, and the oil crisis is roiling everyone economically. If you have any will dare to question the wisdom of the Chief Executive in taking such a measure in time to terrible disease. To weather the storm, we must bat batten down the hatches and decide who we let in alongside us. More miscellaneous income, increased liquid reserves, nice. And advancements in household electronics technology. What's not to love? Besides me. Uh, an economy besieged. Great. We were doing so well, and now someone has to screw it up. Oh god, no. Oh god, no. Contraction. The oil crisis is now in full swing. Oh, I've read this one before. If you want this, please go ahead, too. Use a campfire tie. Yes, please. Hey, 52%, that's getting better. Oh, he sets up up here. Uh, pivot and push. Come on, Kenichiro had read the ports. Regarding the new crisis, regarding his state. For all the oil crisis, all the news and internal signals he had been receiving in the past week were bad. With oil from the Middle East expected to dry up within the upcoming weeks. Oh, well, I've read this one before. Most of the Guangdong's vital issues will also be forced to come to a grinding halt. So, if you continue reading this, please go ahead. Yay. Air Tachi, Type 29 Helicopters. We're going to Iraq. Or oh, Iraq. Iraq, Iraq. You rock, I rock. We all are rocking here. Unusually, genial and crime where it doesn't belong. Oh, what opinion? Look at that. Have your fun. Yeah. Yeah, good. Trial by fire, no respect for the king. Kamal was supposed to be on the call and then he signed among you. He was supposed to. Oh, there's a revolution in Madagascar. I'd be having a conversation about the economic feature of Guangdong. Instead, he was sitting at his desk staring at the Hitachi logo on his phone. The sight of the logo put him into a pensive, even melancholy mood. What really was the worth of his government's relationship with Nissan and Mangyo? Ostensibly, it was supposed to make things better for the whole country. In some ways, they had. But he got the distinct sense that they didn't respect him. He was king here, darn it. He was the most high sovereign of Guangdong. It was the one upon whose shoulders the fates of millions rested. But Nissan and Mangyo, they laughed at his expense, and their laughter had only grown louder over the course of the oil crisis. Why could they not see what everyone else saw, that he was the only one with the power to save Guangdong? How can one, how can a man rule without respect? Give me the phone. Survive must look to our allies with deeper pockets than ourselves. Komai will chain Guangdong closer to the Manchurians and Nissan. Oh boy. They're poisoned water. 
The only people who combine these are those who know their place beneath his feet. But you executive will push forward on his own system and assert himself. This is the executive's order. Our loyal and devoted citizens, the lifeblood of Guangdong's productive engine, assists assets that will determine the fate of Guangdong's uncertain yet bright future. Building blocks that serve to support Guangdong's continued state of perpetual prosperity. These pieces. Pawns of the Grand Design of our Chief Executive must be kept in calm and useful, as they are the key to protecting Guangdong and her serenity from the menace of this oil crisis. Our Chief Executive shall interrupt the regularly scheduled programming of Guangdong's televisions and radios and instead broadcast a message. One of all open assurances, requesting the faith and trust of the populace so that they may be united in the battle against the vicious elements of this looming crisis. Though the words may not be entirely genuine, it is no doubt that it will serve its purpose and be that the masses of the three pearls will be kept in check. When the Chief Executive speaks, people listen. They will respect me. Mind turning. Kamai turned away from the phone and looked out of the window. His uh, at a city, his country. What would it take you to extricate Nissan and Mangyo from Guangdong? What would it take to render them important to the power structure of the country? It would take effort, for one thing. Nissan was tangled up in Guangdong like violence or brick wall. They could resist his efforts, so they needed to make sure that the resistance came to not, though. But circumstances was on Kamai's side. There was an oil crisis in progress. And had he just learned that a great many companies, including Guangdong's Mightiest, were suffering? The crisis had made it possible to deal blow to a company that they'd otherwise recover from. Without a mind, a plan of attack took shape in his mind. They all respect me, Kamai said. Nissan, Mangyo, the Zabatsu, the people, they will all respect me. Time to go to war. In the East, Middle Eastern boondongle. If you're going to do this, please go ahead. So it sounds like there's two options for us here. We could go with Hitachi, and, uh, or going with just by ourselves, of course, and pushing forward no matter what. Or we could maybe even... Uh, Ooh, do we have a crisis here? Only 9%, huh? Um, we need how much? 53? Oh, yeah, we're okay there. Um, go by ourselves or go with Nissan and them. So maybe there's two routes here we could do? I'm kind of open to either one, so. That sounds like fun to me. Doing both, eventually, as long as I don't get killed by trying to smuggle things. Empty hands. Uh, where is Yuhin to his finest children food eat? Store after store after store, after store have been cleaned dry of the product if any had been at all. Those who do have something to serve, sell, have little to offer. One employee at one of the stores he visited offered a single cup of yogurt. He bought it, but he cannot sustain his children. He trudges on, peering through the closed folding gates and empty storefronts. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. At least a superstore. Uh, up the road will have something, he thinks. Yeah, though. Will it? The prices only rise further and further, and there will be even less to fight over. What happens to the people like him? No one is unaffected, but there are so few who are less affected than others. Yu and Hin is not one of them, unfortunately. There's a few superstores now near, nearby. He speeds up his gate. The scene he sees next is terrible. Food and drink are strewn about around the floor. Shards of glass sprinkle the scene intermittently. He dares not step on the store further, lest he falls and slip into the mess. From his vantage point, he sees someone lying prone near aisle 12. They're wearing a blue shirt and black pants. They probably got trampled, praying for their health, but knowing that they're most likely dead, he steps out. You hand and the kids would not eat today. The very limit. The chief executive tapped his select black fountain pen atop his mahogany desk. He contemplated his choices, his fingers squeezing his wrinkled forehead. Uh, the documents and reports placed before him puzzled his conscience. How does such a, such a thing happen? The framed paintings resting upon his decorative wall seemed to stare towards him, with contempt berating him for his failures, for his ineptitudes, for his indecisiveness. He felt the walls of his office inching slowly and gradually towards him, with the intention of crushing him to dust. He slammed his fists onto the desk as his surroundings were reverted to normal, taking exasperated deep breaths as a couple of sheets of paper glided off his table and onto the wood floor. Kamai sat and forced himself to stand up, gathering the fallen papers from the floor and straining them upon his desk. He looked towards the economic report he held, skimming over the contents and focusing entirely upon the number representing Guangdong's substantial deficit. He clenched his lips in frustration as he slammed the papers back onto his desk and continued to gaze at the grass and charts. It was untenable, he thought. He would have to implement drastic measures. The budget was his main problem. If he wanted to rescue Guangdong from the time of catastrophe, catastrophic fiscal peril, the only option he had was to freeze a budget. It was necessary, he reassured himself. Kamal lifted his cell phone after another deep breath, punching in the numbers of the ministry needed. I had a couple of rings, the line was connected. Yes, hello? Freeze it. The beginning. But with the beginning there, we're going to end the episode there. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. So we'll see what we can do to save Guangdong from itself and maybe even Nissan. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.